Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Sharina. Uh, we'll begin with the presentation now, but before that I request all of you to write all your questions in the Q&A box so that we can address them at the end of the talk. Um, Thomas, I think you can share your screen now and we can begin. Can you see the screen? Yes. <clears throat> okay, great. So happy World Bear Day, everyone. Today, I'm going to speak a little about wildlife SOS bear research and conservation work. And I, I think it's important at the start to talk about how integral bears have been to wildlife SOS since its inception, wildlife SOS has been working with bears. And it's interesting, and it's, so it's no coincidence that actually our main logo, which is on this slide, is of a bear, of a sloth bear. And it's more interesting also because in the West, I'm in the United States, when people hear I work with bears in India, um, they, they often say, I didn't even realize that there were bears in India. And not only are there bears in India, but there's actually four species of bear in India. And it's one of only two countries in the world that can say that. So before we get started in talking about the four bear species in India, I thought it would be a good, day, a good time since it is World Bear Day to kind of review the eight species of bear in the world today. Um, starting with polar bear and working all the way down to pandas. This is a phylogenetic tree showing the eight species. And so we'll start at the top with the polar bear. The polar bear is a very interesting bear, actually very much a marine bear, as its Latin name suggests. And because they're a marine bear, often polar bear biologists spend more time in, in marine mammal conferences than they do actually in bear conferences. Obviously, this bear lives on the ice, but it also spends a lot of time in the water, and it's actually protected also as a marine mammal. Then there's the closely related brown bear. Brown bears actually have the largest range out of any bears in the world. They're found in the United States, Canada. They used to be found in Mexico, and obviously they're also in Europe and Asia. And we actually have them in India, and we'll talk a little more about that later. And then we come to the American black bear. This bear is actually, probably there are more American black bears than any other bear species. Where they're found in the USA and Canada, they are quite common and um, are very adaptable to different types of habitat. Although truly they're really a forest bear. And then we kind of come to the Asian counterpart to the American black bear, the Asiatic black bear also known as the moon bear. This is the bear that you might have heard a lot about in terms of Chinese medicine, um, bio bear farms, or a lot of conservation issues with this species. And it, it also, you can even see in this picture, it's kind of noted for having these big Mickey Mouse type ears. And then we come to the sloth bear and as you might guess, at Wildlife SOS, we're a little partial to this species. It's a very unusual bear. To my mind, it is the most interesting of all the bears. And again, um, Westerners, their first introduction to this bear is usually through Kipling's The Jungle Book. But unfortunately, this is the cartoon that I grew up with for The Jungle Book. And clearly, this does not look at all like a sloth bear. I, I guess it looks more like a brown bear, it's hard to tell. But in a more recent version of the Jungle Book, Disney kind of went full blown brown bear. We know that Baloo was a sloth bear because the Jungle Book basically takes place in central India. There's only one bear species and it is a sloth bear. 
So we are hoping that in, if anyone can talk to Disney, I mean, the next time they do a, a version of the Jungle Book, I don't, I don't see why they wouldn't show a soft bear more accurately. And then we come to the sun bear. The sun bear is the smallest of all the bear species. It's an excellent climber. And as you can see in this photograph, it actually has an incredibly long tongue, which it uses largely to eat insects. Then we come to our one South American bear, the Andean bear. This bear has also been known as the spectacled bear. And the reason for that, as you can see in this photograph, is the light colored fur that kind of surrounds the darker eyes. But these days, most people simply refer to it as the Andean bear. And then finally, we come to the most unusual in many ways of bears, the giant panda. This bear is only found in China. And the good news for giant pandas is that in recent surveys, the suggestion is that the wild populations have gone up a bit. So hopefully that's true and hopefully that will continue to happen. And just to be perfectly clear, um, the koala bear, not a bear, it's actually a marsupial. And the red panda is not a direct relative of the giant panda. So they're not a bear either. So we mentioned earlier that there are four species of bear in India. These are the species. Starting in the left, we have the brown bear, the Asiatic black bear, then the sloth bear in the upper right corner, and finally the sun bear. Now the only other country in the world which has four bears would actually be China. Uh, sun bears barely make it into China, and then they also have the Asiatic black bear, the brown bear, and of course the giant panda. It's also interesting to note that of the eight species, these are the least studied bear species in the world, the Andean bear, the sloth bear, and the sun bear. And so clearly two of these species uh, are located in India and ones that we work with. So backing out, just to give everybody an idea of the distribution of these different bears in Asia, the brown bear is colored in brown on this map. The Asiatic black bear, as you can see, is in green. And you can see it's in the Himalayans, Himalayas. The sloth bear is in red. As you can see, it's the only bear in mainland India and Sri Lanka. But it also occurs on the foothills of the Himalayas and in Northeast India. And then finally, in yellow, we have the sun bear. So when we talk about wildlife SOS and bears, there's really only one place to start, and that is with the sloth bear. And this obviously goes back to our founders, Kartik and Gita, when they started wildlife SOS, rescuing sloth bears was the main, main conservation project wildlife SOS was working on. And this is because of the dancing bear practice. And probably most of you have heard of it, but basically the young cubs are poached. Often the mother is killed. And then these cubs are brought up to dance at the end of a rope. Their muzzle is pierced and a rope put through it. It's a very inhumane practice. And this would also have an effect on the wild populations as if you really want to hurt a wildlife population of any animal, you go after the young and you would also um, take out the breeding females. So in the upper right-hand corner, that's a picture of a calendar person. They were the ones dancing the bear, handing the bear over to Dr. Arun. And they would give their bear and then Wildlife SOS would help them to make money in another type of business. One where they could usually actually make more money. So in the end, this would be good for the bear, as long as the people didn't go back to practicing dancing bears, and it's good for the people. So kind of a win-win. And the last bear was rescued in 2009, but of course, then we had a lot of sloth bears, and these bears could not be returned to the wild. So four sanctuaries were made across India, and 
over, um, well, 628 bears rescued from that dancing trade were at one point so, somewhere in one of our four sanctuaries. We still have roughly 200 bears. Now, while we still have bears from the dancing trade, we also do have some bears that have come to Wildlife SOS at these sanctuaries from other human bear conflicts, um, bear, young cubs that were rescued from poachers or injured in some sort of human bear conflict. And some of them also reside at our sanctuaries. So that's how Wildlife SOS really came to really be working with the sloth bear. And so now I wanna back out a little. And before we really talk about some of our projects on wild bears, I just wanna talk about a little, a little about what makes a sloth bear a sloth bear. And to my mind, there are two species, it's actually a lot of termite species, but let's just say two animals which have had a major impact on the evolution of sloth bears so that they've become the bear that they are today. So the termite and the tiger, these are the two species which have greatly affected the sloth bear. And it, first, speaking of the termites, bears have evolved to become myrmecophagous. And what this means is sloth bears, roughly half their diet in the wild is made up of ants and termites. And they've had physical adaptations to, to be more efficient at feeding on termites and ants, including losing their two front teeth so that they could suck out the termites with their protrusible lips. And they also have very long claws. And these claws are perfect for digging. Termite mounds are very hard, but these bears can dig into the side of a termite mound and then suck out all the termites. And interestingly enough, they've also evolved some behaviors that they have in common with other myrmecophagous mammals that they're not at all closely related to. Um, here you have the sloth bear in the middle, obviously, and then the giant anteater on the right, the lesser anteater on the left, and other myrmecophagous mammals also carry their young on their back. There can be a lot of reasons why they do this, but clearly one of the main reasons is predation. Now, tigers do prey on sloth bears. They're really the only natural predator of a sloth bear in the wild of an adult bear. And roughly, if you look at tiger diet studies in national parks, um, roughly 2% of a tiger's diet can actually be made up of sloth bear. But sloth bears are not at all easy prey. And in fact, and I've been studying this a bit, the reality is that most tiger bear encounters end up with the bear living through the encounter. And the way that they live through this encounter is by, come, is by becoming incredibly aggressive. These bears are very tough bear. Pound for pound, I do think this is one of the toughest animals on the planet. I would swear by that. And they still have long, long canines, long teeth, and they can be incredibly aggressive. This picture taken by actually a friend of Wildlife SOS, Dickie Singh, shows a confrontation between uh, a tiger and a sloth bear. This sloth bear is a mother, and you can see she actually has two cubs on her back. And in this encounter, she actually faced both the female and the male who had been courting when she wandered into this field. And she was able to actually fight both of them off. Here she is getting up on her hind legs. And when a bear gets up on its hind legs like this, it's actually quite intimidating to the tiger, but it also frees up their front paws on which they have those very long claws which are very formidable weapons. So she lived to face another day. And clearly, sloth bears and tigers have a very complex relationship, probably somewhat mutual respect. Um, and I thought, instead of just showing these photos, we try to run this video. I know it might be a little choppy. This video, I think, actually went viral. And this is a tiger that obviously it sneaks right up on this sloth bear. The sloth bear still has no idea there's a tiger behind it. And we know that because we can see how it reacts once it does notice. And it reacts in the typical fashion that the sloth bear does. They spin and huff and stand. And then it's usually followed by a charge, especially when the tiger is at close quarters. 
Nelly Spear clearly doesn't see the second tiger crouch there. And as soon as it does, it shoots up again on its hind legs. It chases that tiger. Now, really, the only thing that Sloth Bear wants out of this encounter is to escape with its life intact. So that bear has clearly realized that it can no longer push these tigers any further. It's pushed his luck far enough. And now he's going to try to make his escape, hoping that the tigers don't follow. But he doesn't go too far without checking back and making sure he's not being followed. And in this case, the tigers have no interest in following him any further. And so this bear actually lives through this encounter by being aggressive. Not by trying to run or be super vigilant, but by being aggressive towards the tiger. And so with that, I want to start talking about some of Wildlife SOS's wild sloth bear research. And today we're just going to cover four aspects of that research, starting with sloth bear attacks, relocation of problem sloth bears, threats to sloth bears, and finally, some on sloth bear denning. Now, sloth bear attacks, unfortunately, are rather common, hundreds annually. And the reality is that there's probably more sloth bear attacks in a year than all of their seven bear species combined. But remember, this is a very, they're only attacking defensively. It's important to note that we just looked at their reaction to a tiger. This is how soft bears react to a threat. So in other words, why are they so aggressive with people? Well, they're somewhat hardwired to when they're being threatened to charge if they don't have time to run away. Clearly, these beer bears will move away if you give them a chance. But if, if you stumble upon them and get relatively close, their first instinct is to attack. And they simply want to escape the situation. So, Wildlife SOS got involved in doing some soft bear attack work. We did our study in southern India in the state of Karnataka. And we had some very interesting findings. And then we went on and wanted to compare our findings to that of other soft bear researchers who had done work on bear attacks through other parts of India. And we actually wanted to also look at comparisons between our study results and other study results. And a lot of these results were quite similar, but there were some big changes. Now, our study was on the Deccan Plateau in Karnataka on the far left there. And you can see that on the Deccan Plateau, we had more attacks at night and less during the day, especially if you compare it to Sri Lanka, the study in Maharashtra, even in the Kanapench corridor. Now, why would that be? And we think in this case, what it turns out to be is how the bears are using the habitat. In other words, on the Deccan Plateau, there's an abundance of rocky caves, and bears use that to den in. And we'll talk more about denning in a bit. But because the bear can be tucked away in a den, if a person is out collecting food or products from the forest, you're not likely to stumble across one, because sloth bears actually sleep usually during the middle of the day. However, if you're in a place like Sri Lanka, where there aren't many caves, the bears will den almost anywhere, under logs, under bushes. And often, you know, if you're crashing through a bush and there's a bear under it, you're more likely to be attacked. So there are regional differences, and it somewhat depends on how the animals use their habitat. Now, with all this data, Wildlife SOS put together a film with the director named Thomas Rowell on living with sloth bears. It's actually... If anybody has an interest in looking at it, you can find it free online. It's only about a 10 minute film. And it basically, and it's been put in several different languages now. And it's basically just a guide to the best ways to, if you're living with soft bears, the best ways to avoid attacks. And then if you are attacked, what to do to best survive that attack. So we published a few papers on this and um, clearly there are things you can do. Again, make noise. And this is the same actually for many other bear species, including brown bears. Make noise, stay in groups. And with soft bears, if it attacks, you can't fall to the ground and cover up. Again, this bear doesn't want to eat you. It simply wants to get rid of a threat that it sees and then it'll run off. 
and there are regional differences. So that kind of flows into another thing we've been studying, which is a relocation of problem softwares. And when we talk about problem softwares, we're often talking about the fact that they've attacked many people. This bear actually has a collar on it. This was actually a case study. And basically this bear was thought to have attacked several people. The government allowed us and gave us permission and worked with us to move this bear into Banner Gata National Park. Now, in the United States and Canada, if you move an American black bear or a brown bear, they often return to the site that they were first captured in. We were curious what would happen here. Now, relocation has definitely happened in India a bit uh, long before we did this study, but there wasn't much documentation as to how successful that relocation was. So with the collar on the bear, and it's kind of split up in the two month increments, this is somewhat typical. The bear is released and it covers a big broad area you can see in the first map on the left. And then over the next two months, it starts to dwindle down the size that it's roaming over. And this is actually typical of a relocation that works well. So this bear did not, even though it was relatively close, did not attempt to return to where it was first captured. And then it got, it started using a smaller and smaller area. This story actually did have an unhappy ending as the bear was killed by an explosive device actually set up for wild pigs, which was very traumatic for all of us. Um, but it did show that the relocation can actually work quite well. And we published a paper on this. Um, the bear did not attempt to move home. It actually even got pregnant, which shows that it was getting used to its habitat. But how this bear was killed clearly had a big impact on us. And as we are in the conservation business, we wanted to look into more research, what was going on here, how big a threat these was. And this led us to another research project that we have on soft bear threats and conservation. Now, overall, we know that one of the biggest threats to this species is habitat loss. Um, we think that 50% of all soft bears occur outside of really protected habitat. And then we've talked about attacks and how those can be a conservation concern. There's obviously poaching even now after the dancing bear trade was ended, but then we got into these risks that on the Deccan Plateau in Southern India, these bears are facing. And really that should say anthropogenic risks. Um, and we looked at snares, which are a problem in India as well as all of Asia open wells, these small explosives that we just mentioned, and even roads. And as we all know, roads are an issue for wildlife everywhere in the world. This is a bear that had fallen into an open well. These are a risk to these bears. And Dr. Arun and Wildlife SOS have been down in Karnataka since about 2006 and have been called out to rescue bears. So what we did was we took all the data that over the years had been collected and started looking at how big a risk these factors were to bears. And you can see here that snares kind of outweighed everything, which really wasn't too surprising, followed by the explosive devices we saw, open wells and then roadkill and some other random ones. Now, the bears that were caught in snares, we actually had relatively good luck with most of these bears so not only survive, but we're in good enough shape that after taking them back to the center, making sure they're healthy, could be released back to the wild. Unfortunately, bears that fall victim to these explosive devices, which by the way, only seem to be an issue in Southern India, uh, those died um, as soon as that explosive went off. The bears from the open wells, most were able to be saved, most survived the fall. And uh, many, some were able to be released back to the wild as well. Roadkill, obviously, a big problem. Something else we discovered while doing this study, which we actually did not expect, we expected the opposite, was that more females were falling victim to these anthropogenic risks than were males. Now, the reason for this uh, could be multifaceted 
certainly we think that one possible reason is that the females tend to be closer to the edges of the habitat. And in fact, 23% of the females that fell victim to these uh, were either pregnant or with cubs. So you can see that this is a big concern. So we published a paper in Ursus about our findings, which we think is important for conservation of soft bears in this area, but also actually did tell us, gave us hints about how soft bears were living on the Deccan Plateau. And of course, this led us, and we had already been working on a soft bear denning study in Karnataka on the Deccan Plateau as well. This is a picture of a soft bear cave. And to be clear up front, soft bears do not hibernate. So how do they use dens? Well, they actually use dens in two different ways. They use them as resting dens. Now, resting dens are used by any adult or subadult bear simply to sleep, usually during the middle of the day. And resting dens can be anything from under a bush to a naturally occurring cave, even an old abandoned house. Um, now, maternal dens on the other side are only dens that are used by female soft bears to give birth to and then raise their cubs because they actually will continue to use that den. Sometimes they use multiple dens. So this is one of our study areas on the Deccan Plateau. And this map shows you in blue, all the resting dens we found. And then in yellow, just only four of them you can see there are the maternal dens. And it makes sense that we would find a lot more resting dens than we would maternal dens. This picture on the right is a picture from a camera trap. What we would do if we found a den that was active, we'd set up a camera trap and then we watch to see if it's actually a maternal den or just a resting den. And it, the resting dens can be used periodically. The software won't use it every night. The maternal dens are used more regularly. And it, of course, it's abundantly clear when you have video and photos of a mother bear with cubs, that then you have a maternal den. We would actually keep the cameras on these maternal dens for literally years so that we could document behaviors. This is just another picture of a mother coming out of a den, obviously the young cub riding on her back. And that's how we figured this out. Now, here's a video. I hope this plays okay. And this is what you would see as a video. This is the first time we figured this was a maternal den. You see the young cub disembarking from his mother's back. And then the mother actually, and this is to be expected, notices that camera trap making a little noise and she wants to go and check out that camera trap, which is uh, typical. But then they get used to it and it doesn't bother them anymore. So we are close to publishing our first paper. I don't wanna jinx it right now. We're very close to publishing our first paper on um, soft bear denning. First of several, we're hoping. And we've had several important findings, including the fact that dens tended to be closer to the edges of forests than we expected. And even more surprising, that the maternal dens on the Deccan Plateau seem to be even closer to the border than a normal resting den. Um, and this predilection of mother bears to dens so close to the edges of forests, it's kind of a high risk, high reward venture. They have access to water, crops, you know, orchards perhaps, so food and water, but it also puts them closer to anthropogenic risk, like snares, like roads. And this is piecing all these different studies together, we can start to understand the big picture a lot better. So that's just four of our studies with soft bears. We actually have more, but I wanted to now change direction and talk a little bit about Wildlife SOS and Asiatic black bears. This is a map, a simple map kind of showing a distribution. If you look at the light brown color on this map, that is your Asiatic black bears. So there's basically two areas of India which have Asiatic black bears, and that's the area near Kashmir, and that's Northeast India. And 
Asiatic black bears are generally a shy bear. They're not nearly as aggressive as soft bears can be. And attacks are generally quite rare. However, this has not been the case in Kashmir, unfortunately, where attacks have been quite common. Now, why is this the case? Why would it be so different here? And it seems the main reason is that a lot of, of the wild habitat has been converted to crops and orchards. And these orchards, such as apple orchards, cherry orchards, even some nut orchards are really a magnet for these bears. And their natural habitat is destroyed. So they're gonna go where they can get food. This puts them in close proximity to humans. And this has become a big problem. And how big a problem this is, is shown in this graph. Now we have a, an office in Kashmir. It's led by Alia Murr. And she works closely with the forest department there. And this is some of the data. I, I think that the end of this graph is more important than the start, because as things got ramped up in Kashmir to deal with this problem, um, there could have been more attacks than were documented in 2006. But you can see at the peak, we're looking at roughly 300 attacks a year. The orange is the number of people killed. So about 4% of the people attacked were killed. Well, we're getting close to 300 attacks annually in just the Kashmir Valley. But more recently, the numbers have drastically dropped quite a bit. Now, why have the numbers dropped so far? Well, there's several reasons. Um, we don't know precisely, but clearly there have been some retaliation killings. We know this, some have been documented. But on the positive side, we think a lot of this actually has to do because there's bears are still relatively common in the area. Uh, bear awareness programs, Ali has done bear awareness programs. The forest department has really done a great job in getting rolling and um, having control rooms and getting out to help people so the people aren't attacked and bears aren't killed. And so all these things together have made a big impact. Now we are working on a manuscript on this as well. Um, so if you're interested in this, um, hopefully something will be out relatively soon. And now I wanna stay up in Kashmir area. And I wanna talk a little about wildlife SOS's work with brown bears. Now, this is the same brown bear. Uh, I don't wanna say it's the same brown bear, but this is the same species that's found in Yellowstone Park in the United States different subspecies, Isabellinus. So let's go back to the map. You can see where there are brown bears in India. Again, it's up in the Kashmir Ladakh area and it goes along the high Himalayas. And that's the one area in India that has brown bears. And this is a threatened population of brown bears. Um, it's estimated that there's between 130 and 220 adult bears. And um, this population is somewhat cut off. We think the males, there might be some males moving back and forth with a, China, a population in China. The females, definitely there's no movement. Um, so it's somewhat isolated population. This is actually a picture from Yellowstone National Park back in the late 60s, early 70s when uh, bears being food conditioned at these dumps was a huge problem. A major um, bear conservation work was done to move these dumps, get these brown bears living a more natural lifestyle versus just trying to feed at dumps. It's, it's quite bad for the bears, obviously. And unfortunately, we're seeing something quite similar in Kashmir where a lot of these bears are food conditioned and this was our first year working in Kashmir on brown bears, basically collecting baseline data and trying to understand how many bears are food conditioned, how bad the situation is. And so we'd go out, our team, and, and at night would spotlight bears at dumps and try to get a count, see how many bears were going to the different dumps. This is actually two different mothers with young cubs. This is just an interesting side note. Um, Cubs from two different mothers were uh, documented playing together. We're working on a manuscript on that as well. A very interesting behavior. But 
what we found in our first year is that the majority of bears up in Kashmir seem to be food conditioned. It's an issue and those aren't the only threats to this population of brown bears around Kashmir. There's more development planned. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do there and we are going to continue our work in Kashmir on brown bear conservation. And finally, we come to the last bear that's found in India. This is the sun bear, as we mentioned before, this is the world's smallest bear. Um, and they just kind of creep into Northeast India in some of the states like Assam, Magalia, um, Nagaland. We haven't been doing a ton of work on sun bears, but we have been involved in a bit of work with the other IUCN bear specialty group biologists looking at the biogeography of bears in Northeast India. Now, excuse me, there's the reason why there's such interest in this area is that you actually have three species of bear that occur in Northeast India and how closely they overlap isn't exactly known, but it would be one of only a few places in the entire world which would actually have three bears, potentially even in one forest patch. You're curious, the others are actually Churchill in Canada. Seasonally, you can have uh, polar bears. Um, you also have brown bears in the area and you can even have American black bears from the surrounding forest. And then there is a park in China, uh, the name eludes me, but that has giant pandas. They also have Asiatic black bears and even brown bears. However, none of those bears overlap. Um, certainly you don't have brown bears where you have the giant pandas. So it's a somewhat unusual area. Now as well, you can see that superficially, these three bears actually look somewhat alike. They're all black bears with a blaze on their chest. It'd be very easy to confuse these three bears if you didn't look at bears all day, or even if you did, if you get a glimpse of a bear in the wild, it can be hard to tell which bear species you're actually looking at. Now, clearly, one way you can tell that's the Asiatic black bear on the left. Again, those big Mickey Mouse ears makes it somewhat um, noticeable. I won't go into all the differences, but that's obviously our sloth bear in the middle with the wider muzzle and longer claws, fuzzier. And then the sun bear, which is smaller, has small ears, and that blaze on the chest tends to be more of an orangish color in the sun bears. But you can see where there would be a lot of confusion about these. Now, because of this, even looking back at historical records on the distribution of sun bears in Northeast India, it's, it's somewhat questionable. Um, really, the only way to be 100% sure these days is to get like a camera truck photo. But so, you know, looking back at historical records, there's some uncertainty. I've also worked in Bhutan and in Bhutan there was, they only have two species in Bhutan, the um, Asiatic black bear and the uh, soft bear, but there's been so much confusion about the soft bear there that it, it turns out soft bears barely make it into Bhutan. Uh, so, so th there's just a lot of confusion about these species in this part of the world. Now in India, there is, it is still possible that seasonally there are three species in one area. We're still looking into that, so I don't want to give too much away at this point. But um, so basically that's it. I did want to give a shout out to the team that works in India, the field teams. That's actually Swami in the upper left. He's actually, He's our lead field biologist. And so that's him actually climbing out of a soft bear den, believe it or not. Um, and some of his team below. And then to the right, that is Dr. Arun working on a soft bear. Dr. Arun, as well as being our lead vet, is also heavily involved in all the wildlife, wild bear, wild soft bear, and other bear research we are doing. So um, 
I wanted to end with the software, of course. So um, that's all I had for today. Um, I don't know if you have any questions or what we want to do now. Okay, thanks, Thomas. That was really incredible and insightful. We do have a bunch of questions, so I'll read them out to you and you can answer. So the first one is, um, in the wild, sloth bears don't live in large groups. So can you speak to how uh, you are making that work at the Wildlife SOS Rescue Centers? Okay, so if I understand what you're getting at with the question, it's true. Um, sloth bears don't live in large groups in the wild, but you know, sloth bears, even more than other bears, are known to get along quite well. For bears in general, um, if they have enough food, they can be relatively um, social. That's why you have, say, at, at a garbage dump, you can have a lot of bears. At a salmon stream, something more natural, you can have a lot of brown bears, for example, and they'll kind of form hierarchies. But sloth bears, what I find, and I'd be curious what our vets and keepers think at Wildlife SOS as well, but I think that sloth bears are, they get along with other bears quite well, like even male bears. And we know that with say brown bears, infanticide, I don't wanna say it's common, it's more common than with sloth bears where the males will kill cubs, but this doesn't seem to be at all a thing with sloth bears. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. In fact, we have to gather more evidence about that in the wild, but they seem to do quite well socially. I mean, they bicker and fight a lot, but fights are not at all common. They don't seem to be common in the wild and certainly at our centers. I remember talking with Kartik about this years ago when I first started um, working with Wildlife SOS and Kartik told me that, you know, when they started putting bears, they were very careful about putting too many bears together. And whenever the bears would squabble or talk a lot, they'd get nervous if they were going to fight. But it became evident quite early on that these bears will get along relatively well in big groups. I hope that somewhat answers your question. Yes, thanks. Um, how do bears mark their territory? That's an interesting question. Um, well, several different ways. Bears don't have true territories where they actively will keep other bears out usually. Um, but they use chemical communication. We have found actually through our studies, we actually published a small thing on this that sloth bear males will actually do PD marking, which is foot marking, where they actually rub their back foot into the ground they will also claw trees and rub trees and they leave scent on it. And so other bears can get an idea. And it is interesting with the denning study where we see a lot of that. In front of dens, you'll have males PD marking and then even defecating, urinating and rubbing on things so that other bears that come up to that cave or den will know that there's another bear there. And of course, the bear's sense of smell is better than a dog's sense of smell. They're known as world-class, they have world-class olfactory um, skills. And so they basically leave scent marks in different ways. And that's how they pick up on where the other bears are living and what they're doing. All right. Um, what if a mother sloth bear is killed? So what will happen to her cubs? And what can we do to help? Um, well, certainly um, the likelihood is, especially with the young cub, if, if the mother bear is killed, unless that cub gets help, um, it's going to die until it is at least probably, I'm going to estimate here about at least a year and a half old. Before then, the cub simply won't make it on its own. When Wildlife SOS finds a cub that young, obviously we take it back to our sanctuaries because they're not gonna make it out in the wild. So um, interesting point is that other bear species that we haven't seen this in sloth bears, but adoption by other adult bears has been shown in polar bears and brown bears and even American black bears. Now, whether that ever happens with sloth bears, I, I don't think we know. I haven't seen a study which shows it yet 
But other than that occurring, um, a cub below a year and a half will um, will die without help from say wildlife SOS. And if, if you support wildlife SOS, um, we do some of that work. Okay. Um, are there any techniques, uh, methods or equipments which can reduce the human and black bear conflict? Equipment? Or methods or techniques? For the Asiatic black bear conference, well, or conflicts. What we've been involved in and, and what the forest department is doing is several things. It, it's interesting when we're looking at the data on time of day that those Asiatic black bear conflicts are happening. It's happening when people are showing up to work at their orchards. So simply by making people more aware, and again, Alia is doing a great job in Kashmir of working with the local people to teach them. Okay, there, there are certain, like, I brought it up with sloth bears. I didn't talk about it with brown bears. Brown bears, it's been shown that, or brown bears, but Asiatic black bears, we don't have as much, we don't have as much data on attacks. Because quite frankly, attacks aren't common in other places. With other bear species, we do know that if you make noise or move in groups, that bears will be less likely to attack. A lot of these attacks are simply happening because the bear is surprised at close quarters. And so if we teach the people to make noise, to move in groups through their orchards and what have you, I think that can make a big difference. In terms of equipment, I, I'd have to give that a little more thought. Um, maybe talk to Alia a little more about that, but it's a good question. Right. Um, do males and females use the same den for resting? And a second part by someone else is, how do we specifically identify a resting den versus maternal den? So when it comes to resting dens, I mentioned just quickly that resting dens, they're not used nightly. So um, you may have a bear that uses a certain resting den um, once a month. You know, they might be roaming over their area and have several different areas that they would choose to um, spend the day and sleep. In our area, um, it is very conceivable that um, a female or a male bear could use another bear's resting den if it's empty because they're not overly attached to them. Maternal dens are different. They're much more attached to them. I, I used to work on golden eagles and other bird species. And so I think of often like an eagle nest, you know, where you raise your chicks and you're constantly coming back to the same nest. It's the same way with the dens for these bears. And the way we told the difference, I kind of covered it pretty quickly. But again, we did that by simply putting camera traps. If we saw a den was being used regularly, we put a camera trap on that den. And, and by doing that, um, if it's a maternal den, you're going to find out quite quickly. Um, just in a few days, you'll have the mother bear returning with her cubs. And that's how we know the maternal from the resting dens. And we really did try to focus on those maternal dens and keep camera traps on the maternal dens because so little is known about maternal denning in soft bears in the wild. And like I said, um, I'm hoping we'll have our first publication soon and we have at least a couple more that are going to come out on the behavior of the uh, denning um, so so keep an eye out for those great okay next one is uh, is it true that a bear focuses its attack on the face in case of an encounter with a human it's a great question and yes it is true um i work a lot with a guy named Tom Smith. He's uh, a brown bear, American black bear attack expert. And so we've been able to look at the differences between soft bear attacks and brown bear attacks and even American black bear attacks. And certainly with brown bears, and it, it, the same holds true for soft bears, and it seems to hold true for Asiatic black bears as well. They do go for the head. Um, and it, it makes sense, right? If you want to incapacitate 
a threat if you go after the face, especially the eyes, that type of thing. Um, it makes sense to go after the head and the face. So yes, it's true that brown bears do it. It's true that sloth bears do it. And thinking of our data with Asiatic black bears, it's true that Asiatic black bears do it. My guess is most bears, when attacking, will go after the head and the face. Okay, thanks for that. Um, another one is, are bears playful in their nature, usually? Yes, actually, quite playful. Um, um, the cubs play a ton, and as you know, we all know, like with other species of animals, I mean, play is the way for the animals to become more coordinated. It's a way to exercise, and they use, you know, it, bears, especially the cubs, are very playful. And if you visit our sanctuaries, um, you can see with some of our the cubs we have, uh, they're extraordinarily playful with each other and even with items that you put into their, into their um, uh, cages or open areas. Right. Um, why is there less focus on bear research and conservation in India as compared to tigers or Asian lions? That's a good question. I, I do think one reason you know, when you think of tigers, you think of India, and it's one of the only places in the world which has, you know, healthy population of tigers. We all know tigers are incredibly charismatic. And something I've been studying on the side is soft bear tiger interactions. And, you know, tigers are magnificent. There's no denying it. But yeah, of course, we are partial to bears. Um, it's interesting, too, because the sloth bear is one of the least studied bears in the world. Um, and we're changing that slowly, but, but it's interesting because, you know, in the United States, that wouldn't be the case. Uh, brown bears are studied extensively, American black bears. But I think just because, especially in India, you have so many charismatic species, tigers, lions, elephants, rhinos, I mean, they're all magnificent. And for some reason, I don't know why, but certainly sloth bears, you know, overall haven't been studied much. And most of the studies done on sloth bears to date have actually focused on attacks. And of course we've done uh, bear attack studies as well, and they should be done. But studying the ecology of this species is so interesting. They are such an unusual bear. I mean, I, I'm hooked for life as I think a lot of my colleagues at Wildlife SOS are, they're just an amazing animal. I, I, I don't know. It's an interesting question though. Absolutely. There's another interesting question. Um, can bears that are being relocated or released be trained to sniff out explosives or some way trained to recognize snares? You know, I, the short answer would be, I don't think so. I think what we're going to have to do, um, I know that Dr. Arun and, and Swami have even talked to the forest department about some of these issues. Um, I think it's not gonna be about training the bears. It's gonna be about doing something to get snares cleaned up, um, to have, you know, like these explosive devices, and I should say this clearly, they are illegal. They're not legal to use. So clearly it's a matter of enforcement. The snares aren't, aren't legal either. Um, so I think it's really more a matter of enforcement and working with the people than doing anything with the bears. Okay, I'm gonna take one last question. Um, like tigers lick their cubs to bond, what do bears do? Tigers do what now? Say that once more. They lick their cubs to bond. What do bears do? Well, um, bears will also do the same thing. Um, and basically, just to give you a little background, um, soft bears, when they give birth, they go into their dens and unlike a tiger or something like that, they will actually stay in the den. Um, for a month or more without coming out. The mother doesn't come out. Now, other bears that hibernate, 
they give birth to their cubs during hibernation. Well, since soft bears don't hibernate, the females will still go into a den. And although it's not hibernation, they'll go in and they'll stay with their cubs in the den without leaving, like I said, for a month or longer. And then when the mother bear first comes out of the den, uh, she'll come out alone. For roughly two weeks, she'll come out nightly just to get a quick drink of water or something to eat and return to her den for about two weeks before she finally brings the cubs out of the den with her, riding on their back, uh, riding on her back. And usually by then the cubs are, mm, you know, at least a month and a half years old, maybe two months old before they ever come out of the den. Okay, perfect. I think uh, we've answered most of the questions. For anyone uh, whose questions we've missed, uh, if you can email them to us, we've mentioned the email ID in the chat box and we will get back to you with the answers. Thank you so much, Thomas. This was really wonderful. And hopefully we will do more webinars like this. Thank you, this was fun. Thank you, bye. Bye.